everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. We are 100% sponsor based, which means that all the revenues we derive come from sponsorships. But I try to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically trying to choose those who have values well aligned to the values expressed on the show, like freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do is a few ad reads right here at the top of the show and then a few ad, ad reads in the middle. And I hope you won't skip them. I hope you'll take the time, listen and see what they have to offer, because again, these are hand selected sponsors. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Swan Private is a concierge financial services firm based in Los Angeles. Now, I've known the Swan team for years, and these guys are laser focused on the Bitcoin mission. They even have a zero tolerance policy for all shitcoining. Recently, their CEO, Corey Clipston, was instrumental in calling out many of these crypto scams right before they collapsed, saving a lot of people a lot of money in the process. Swan Private focuses on guiding high net worth individuals and businesses on all aspects of Bitcoin strategy, including buying, custodying, and market research. This concierge service provides you direct access to a private advisor by text, phone, or email. So go to swanprivate.com slash breedlove today to sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized US dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Michael Bennett, Nate Harmon, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thank you for having us. How's it? <laughs> we are sitting here in Malibu in Swan Studios. You guys are coming from Hawaii for Pacific Bitcoin Conference. And I'm excited to do this because this is one of the first in-person conversations I've had. Definitely first in-person here in Los Angeles. So thank you for joining me for that. Um, you guys are the co-founders of OceanBit. Could you please tell us, I know a little bit about it, but I'd love for my audience to hear about it. What is OceanBit? Yeah, so at the end of the day, OceanBit is a very simple company. We make and sell electric in a very unique sort of way. Um, our company is based around ocean thermal energy conversion, which is the third or fourth, depending on who you ask, baseload renewable energy source. You know, everybody knows geo, hydro, more controversially nuclear. We like, <clears throat> we like nuclear. We like, nu <laughs> we like nuclear and I consider it the third, but... Um, Ocean thermal energy conversion is the fourth base load renewable. It's available 24-7. It's, you know, inexhaustible fuel source, the ocean. Uh, and it runs a heat engine based on the difference in temperature between warm surface water and deep cold water. Very simple. So this is the energy of the sun hitting the surface and then that's driving some type of circular motion between the surface of the ocean and lower down in the ocean? What, when you say heat engine, is that what you're referring to? It's a Rankine cycle. Mm. So it use, you use an ammonia working fluid, and the warm water at the surface boils the, uh, the working fluid, passes through a turbine, mm. of course generating energy, and then the cold deep water which you pump to the surface condenses that ammonia back to a liquid hmm. and you just run it around in a big closed loop. Hmm. Interesting. It's pretty stupid. <laughs> it's pretty dumb. <laughs> we, the, 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 the catchphrase is, uh, it's not rocket science, it's plumbing. <laughs> it's plumbing. Gotcha. <laughs> and so, obviously, this is a huge energy source given that the Earth is 70% covered in oceans, I think. And... Um, 
the sun is always shining on at least a certain side of the planet. And then the idea of OceanBit is to what? Harness this energy source for Bitcoin mining? Yeah, uh, so it's it has a number of use cases. Um, you know, Bitcoin mining just happens to be the best uh, use case to solve its main problem. You know, this is a hundred plus year old energy source. We didn't make this up. I didn't come up with this. Um, it's been done and thought about since the first hydroelectric days, right? Mm. This is an older source. It just has an economies of scale problem. And mm. the International Energy Agency put it best. Uh, you know, at present, the, you know, the single limiting factor for wide, widespread adoption of this is an economic problem mm. rather than a technical problem. And there's something called the innovation valley of death you know it's at the commercial side uh you know the large hundred megawatt mm -hmm. otec plants becomes three to five cent per kilowatt hour energy right mm -hmm. you know we're paying in hawaii 44 cents 46 on maui yeah wow uh, it's the highest in the country and you know <clears throat> and so because it becomes three to five cents at the hundred megawatt scale there's a lot of money for research and development. So over the last hundred years, there have been you know 14 plus plants, small scale plants built. The issue is that in order to go from the hundred kilowatt scale to the hundred megawatt scale, you have to build in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the no one's been able for the last hundred years. And people like Nikola Tesla have been trying to crack this economic problem that we believe. Bitcoin is the solution to mm. yeah. And so the economic problem is what? Transporting the energy away from wherever it's harnessed in a way that's profitable onto the grid, something like that? For the for the pilot scale, right? Like the anytime that you're dealing with um, these large scale like renewable energy projects, they have a they haven't gone through centuries of you know, capital investment and so forth. Now mm. we're seeing with some of the other renewables, those cost curves come down, but early <clears> on, it's really expensive to do. They haven't been mm -hmm. optimized. So for a pilot plant, it's been proposed mm. at the 10 megawatt level that you would actually build out and it would cost somewhere between 200 to $400 million to just get a pilot plant up, which it would be roughly around um, an LCOE levelized cost of energy between 50 like around 40 to 50 cents if you grade connect it mm -hmm. you can drastically drop that down to a competitive energy price if you pull out the high voltage cable you don't moor it to the uh more it you know to the um uh, moor it in place excuse me so if we do what we call a grazing plant but then you run into this problem that if you don't have the high voltage cable who is going to actually buy the energy and mm -hmm. it just so happens that bitcoin is this incredible, incredible tool which will buy all the energy that you'll sell to it. Mm. And so the, Michael touched on it. There, those were the two proposals for the mm. last hundred years, right? There, and all of, the, uh, all of the proposals to get through this 10 megawatt gap have been lumped into two buckets, yeah. right? Grid connected, mm. tr powering land with a 10 megawatt OTEC plant. The problem is that this is... You know, unlike hydro, where you have to, you know, there's massive land use changes or geothermal, OTEC is done out on the ocean, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So there's no land use changes. So the two methods are, you know, you connect it to land mm -hmm. with a big high voltage cable, mooring it in place, anchored to the ground, <clears throat> and then you have to hurricane proof it so it can withstand hurricanes. Mm -hmm. All of those costs and the time, the permitting to get that up and running, <clears throat> drive the cost of energy up. Mm -hmm. So that even though you can sell it to the grid, there's no grid that will buy it. Even right. in Hawaii, oh, Hawaii yeah. where we pay the highest right. per you know per kilowatt hour cost, no one can afford it. Now you don't have to connect this to land, and it doesn't need to be anchored in place because you're not at the end of the day. You're just it's just a big straw. Mm -hmm. A thousand meters down, mm -hmm. so it's not touching the you know the sea floor. Mm -hmm. So the second bucket 
you know, you've got the grid connected. The second bucket is grazing, free floating platform in the middle of the ocean. So you cut that cable, mm -hmm. you cut the mooring, which cuts 10 years off of your lead time. And now you can avoid hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So you can cut all of this capex, but the problem that Bitcoin solves is that for the last hundred years, there has been no one to buy that energy in the middle of the fucking ocean. Mm. Bitcoin solves that. <clears throat> so this is like an tra energy transmission issue then, right? You either have to be moored or connected via this heavy cable to actually sell the energy that you're harnessing. Yeah. But that was not economically feasible. At the 10 megawatt, at the 100 right. megawatt, that makes sense. Because now, again, it's an economies of scale mm -hmm. current, so it gets much cheaper very quickly right. as you b build bigger. The problem is at the 10 megawatt scale, where it make those costs scale linearly yeah. versus exponentially. Gotcha. But with Bitcoin, you can basically do this type of energy harnessing operation anywhere, mine Bitcoin on the spot, and then you've got this on infinitely portable... Um, monetization of the energy effectively yeah. right instantly you know you just plug in the you know your wallet address on land and by the time you've mined it it's already back at shore sounds pretty damn compelling <laughs> so wh where's the devil in the details here because this sounds like okay we have all of this energy resource out here we now have bitcoin which is a way to actually transmit it economically back uh what are we transmitting it to? You're just selling it ultimately, right? So yeah. instead of selling it to the grid, you're selling it to Bitcoin miners. Yep. Um, what What are the hurdle? I mean, this sounds kind of simple and straightforward. We have an old technology that works. We have a new technology that buys the energy now. Yeah. What are the, the hurdles or the hiccups, I guess? I, I think there's a couple of things. So the first thing is that while OTEC has been explored a lot, there's not a... It's not to the, the level of maturity, obviously, that these other technologies are. So there is not a ton of people out there who are experts at doing and building this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, OceanBit, you know, we've we've now partnered and are have a, you know, the world's only grid-connected OTEC plant in place ready for us to start our R&D testing and so forth. We have the leading ocean engineering firm in the world who can do this. You can't just go out and, you know, go... Any old Joe can't go out and build this. You actually mm. need expertise in this to go and scale it out. So we've done that. Um, I think the, the other hurdle, obviously, is that even at the pilot plant size, there is a, uh, while we've reduced CapEx, right, by 50% plus, even a little bit more than that, there is still a cost to doing so. These plants are, you know, expensive. It's not a mm -hmm. million-dollar <laughs> software project. Right. Um so those are two of the elements. Um, Nate, hit on anything if I... There's... One mitigation strategy, an interesting little thing, is instead of, you know, we're in Hawaii, uh, the amount of energy you can generate with OTEC <clears throat> scales with the temperature of the ocean. So, you know, Hawaii, 26 degrees Celsius, you know, average temperature year-round. But if we go to the equator... Mm -hmm. Now we can get 31, 32 degrees Celsius. And so with the same piece of equipment, with the same capital expense, you can generate 70% more energy. Oh, wow. And so in order to make this 10 megawatt, you know, compelling from an economic standpoint, we actually have to intentionally strand this in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. So mm. there's a number of logistical challenges. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, things that, have, of course, these things have been solved, you know, at the 10 megawatt yeah. size, all of these parts are available off the shelf, and we've solved the problem of, you know, shuttling food out to oil and gas platforms, and, you know, at the equator, there are no hurricanes at the equator, mm -hmm. so we don't have, we can yeah. containerize and make, mm -hmm. modularize the whole thing and just buy an old, you know, uh, X, you know, the old Panamax, um class uh, container ships and just plop these containers and generate energy in the middle hmm. of the ocean. But it's, of course, it's a huge engineering challenge, mm -hmm. right? 
Well, and there's one more thing as well. So Nate has developed what we dub the Harmon cycle, um, uh, which is a is is we're working on patenting it right now. Um, but it's the most thermodynamically efficient way to mine Bitcoin. And one of the the other pluses beyond just that energy generation is the system which Nate has developed, and I'll let him talk more about it. Um, what are the two, you know, the, the two things that miners <clears throat> need, right? They need energy and they need cooling. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens we have unlimited cooling. Nate, you should talk to us a little bit about the Harman cycle itself because it's fascinating. Sure. So, yeah, the Harman cycle, what's, you know, what's interesting about OTEC is, you know, unlike your geo where it's, you have really hot temperature, right? Uh, OTEC is very low grade heat source, right? You can swim in it. It's not going to boil you alive Mm -hmm. and melt your skin. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Well, it just so happens that the delta T, the difference in temperature of the OTEC cycle overlaps with the heat output of an ASIC. So you can essentially generate energy with the OTEC Mm-hmm. pump that energy into a Bitcoin mine, and then reincorporate the heat output via a two-phase immersion solution setup back into the OTEX cycle, okay. and then use that unlimited cooling that you have from the you know, freezing cold water that you're pulling up mm-hmm. to sub-cool. You know, <clears throat> essentially, we can cool these miners for free. We get mm. free cooling. Through that pump process you were describing, we already have the cool. We already have to pay for the cooling for the energy side, right? And so we can cool for. And through this, not only are you you know reincorporating the heat and gaining more efficiency, you're also saving tens of millions of dollars on heat exchanger costs mm. hmm. by. You know, a, a heat regenerator is a lot cheaper than titanium plate fin heat exchangers. At the end of the day. Right. And, uh, you know, we get the cooling for free. We've already paid for the, all the cooling infrastructure wow. with the energy part. So you get half of that equation for free, and you can actually achieve a power use efficiency of one, which means all of the energy you're generating is going into the mining activity, you know, the data center activity, rather than having to power air conditioning or lights or right, cameras right, right. or everything else yeah. wow super fascinating okay so i think that's a good intro to what this is and as we were talking about this last time we we're in los angeles together the big overarching punchline here is you have the inexhaustible energy source of the sun ocean combination and now with bitcoin we have this uh theoretically inexhaustible buyer of energy so this is that's a match made in heaven but it sounds like there's even more of a match made in heaven when you get into the thermodynamic specifics of the mining process because you're actually repurposing some of that process for cooling the miners themselves that's interesting um okay i was with brandon quitem last night actually recording a podcast with a few other guys and we were texting last night too <laughs> yeah and you guys here are saying that there's a way in which the ocean bit value proposition related to Bitcoin mining ties into his pioneer species thesis. Um, maybe we could unpack that first for the audience. What is, you know, at a high level, what is the pioneer species thesis and how does it relate to what you guys are doing at ocean bit? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually talk about this a lot. Um, and I had just pulled up the, you know, the foundations of ecology textbook from my, I pulled it out from my graduate studies and was reading these papers from the 1800s. And what's nice, you know, since you're from Hawaii, you can go to the big island and see, you know, where the fresh lava flow is, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And so after the fresh lava flow and it, you know, destroys, kills everything that's living, you have this substrate, right? Basalt, just straight basalt. And then, you know, you go a mile down the road, you start to see some low-lying shrubs, right? And so this is how ecosystems develop, right? Mm -hmm. You have a fresh landscape and that, you know, that 
that first species, that pioneering species comes in something like a moss or a fern. And what happens is the rate of primary productivity in this you know, fresh ecosystem exceeds the amount of respiration. So you end up, when that P is greater than R, you end up with an increase in biomass accumulation. Mm. And they start to break down that hard, tough you know, lava. Productivity is the P. What was the R? Uh, respiration. respiration. So you know, okay. plants versus animals, right? Gotcha. They make their, you know, they make they make their energy from the sun, and then we eat the that animals, energy through yeah. the trophic structure. So they start to break those primary producers, those pioneering species come in, and they develop that soil, right? Mm. And through that soil development, breaking down that hard lava, you know, basalt. Mm-hmm. They break it down and make it habitable for other things, like ohia. Ohia is one of the first trees to grow, you know, our state flower. Um, And so you'll go out in the lava flow and you'll see this tree with the beautiful pom-pom flowers out in the middle of a lava field. Hmm. And then they continue to make soil and eventually you get larger and larger things. So Hmm. Otec is that pioneer species for a new era of ocean industry, right? Mm. By sticking Bitcoin, Bitcoin is that primary producer, right? And it will, you know, uh, incentivize us to go into the middle of the ocean, start breaking down that barrier. You know, you can't, trees can't grow in lava. Mm -hmm. So you have to make that soil first. And so by Bitcoin being that first person, and there's this great analogy as well to Andrew Carnegie. Mm -hmm. When Andrew Carnegie was trying to drive widespread adoption of his newfangled steel product, right? You know, they had done some small scale tests with the military application, but when he really wanted to drive widespread adoption of steel, he formed a bridge company, bought the steel from his steel company, and built a bridge. <clears throat> now, people were too scared to walk across that bridge because <laughs> they got this light, this lightweight material. That's not going to hold anything. No, it can't be that strong. It's light. You know, wrought iron <laughs> is real strength, right? <laughs> so what Andrew Carnegie did was he went to the, the circus that was in town and got their elephant, because popular mythos at the time was that no elephant would step on an unstable structure. Mm. And he walked that elephant across the bridge, mm-hmm. and it was that moment that spawned everything. we The building we are in, the rails that transport all of our goods, the skyscrapers, the Golden Gate Bridge mm. now. In that moment, he spawned a countless amount of industries created mm. trillions of dollars out of nowhere, right? Industries that didn't exist mm. created them. And at the end of the day, Andrew Carnegie didn't do those things. Mm-hmm. He was a very simple man. He wanted to make and sell steel. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, we're a very simple company. We want to make and sell electrons. And just like a pioneer species, lay that soil for all these new oceanographic hmm. industry interesting yeah the bitcoin is that you know ocean bed and this pilot plan and bitcoin are that bridge right the well there will be ocean bit mining or uh, ocean bit mining that will continue to go on it's really that stepping stone to all of these other use cases whether it be uh from seabed mineral <coughs> mining which uh, I'm sure we'll riff on a little bit. Did you bring your manganese nodule? I didn't bring it. God damn it. I know. Um, to things like seasteading, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, space sports. Um, the list goes on mm-hmm. and on of industries that start to open up when you have that energy source, mm-hmm. which was previously stranded but now commercialized, sitting there and building. And that's that's really the beautiful, beautiful thing about you know, and, and how Bitcoin is that pioneer species. And we're seeing that in across a bunch of different ways, but in the mining space specifically. There are trillions of dollars in markets that are suppressed right now, in ocean-based markets, suppressed 
solely by the high cost of marine diesel. If we can supply three to five cent energy in the middle of the fucking ocean, essentially a truck stop in the middle of the uh -huh. ocean, you change the nature of sea industry. Hmm. Super fascinating. So Carnegie himself then was a, obviously a pioneer, right? But he had to prove to people that his <coughs> product was superior. Yep. And he did that with a very visual demonstration. Yep. Um, it's fascinating to think. And we do, the only thing we do on the sea today, right, is basically shipping and drilling for oil. Is there much, what other industries going on out there? I mean, you have the normal ones fishing. that you think of fishing. Fishing, okay, yeah. Cruises, though those tend to be follow and traverse coastlines. Right. But no permanent civilization. Yeah. Yeah. But you we, guys are talking about something more like putting industrial operations out there. Uh, manufacturing? You can do a lot of high energy intensity manufacturing at yeah. the equator. There's no... Again, there's no hurricane. So you're yeah. not dealing with big waves. Everybody thought, oh, how are you going to handle the big waves? There's no big waves. People used to die crossing the equator. <laughs> the equator. Right. You know, when you, sh when you cross the equator on a ship, you have to shave your head because so many people <laughs> would get stranded in the, at the equator. It wouldn't rain for right. months, no wind, and would die of starvation. This is the doldrums? And, it's called the, the doldrums, doldrums yeah. for a reason. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so this... The next point is super interesting to me. How can Bitcoin mining on the ocean lead to true geographic decentralization? Well, this, and, and so this isn't like a, 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 a thesis that we have, like, obviously, like, this is just what Nate and I kind of riff on. And one yeah. of the things that was so interesting when we saw, um, you know, what happened with the... So, first of all, I'll set the table that, you know, we're, you know, Bitcoin and freedom maximalists. We want, you know, a very decentralized network for Bitcoin and for it to be as robust as possible. Um, and the ocean has some unique characteristics to it and OTEC specifically being that it's mobile, mm -hmm. right? So you can actually pick up and move a plant. I think the first time, I mean, really the first time in history that you've had a mobile, you know, full-scale mm -hmm. plant, right? Um, and when you see what happened in China, and if you, you know, play it out to a conclusion that other nations may eventually do that, if you need to go pick up the miners and move them to another place, you could hypothetically pick them up, put them on an OTEC, one of our, the ocean bit OTEC plants, mm -hmm. and run your miners from literally anywhere in the world. And Nate, uh, you should talk more about the EUZ and some of those implement, implement, uh, to, to implement, quote, implications. To quote <laughs> one of my favorite TV shows and characters, Barry Zuckercorn, <laughs> take to the sea. There's no law, there, you know, the, the international law of the sea, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of 200, 200 kilometers right offshore becomes international waters. Mm -hmm. The laws change. Mm -hmm. No one, you... So what, what do ships do, right? These ships, you know, the, the ships that come to the port of L.A., they're not flying a flag of the U.S. They're flying a flag of Panama, mm -hmm. Colombia, Qatar, right? Wherever gives them the best deal, right? Mm -hmm. Even though they constantly come to the U.S. and drop cargo off, and their headquarters of the companies that own them are in, you know, China or the U.S., they fly the flag, of it's called a flag of convenience. Mm -hmm. So, with an OTEC plant mining Bitcoin in the middle of the ocean, let's say, you know, you're flying a flag of the U.S. and the U.S. decides to ban Bitcoin mining, we just <laughs> take that flag down <laughs> and say, hey, who wants it? Mm. Because anyone, and so it's not just you know at the hundred megawatt scale you can connect them to land. So you're providing energy, you know, security to, uh, you know, all of the countries in the, you know, around the tropics. Yeah. <clears throat> but because this can be done in the middle of the ocean, outside of any jurisdiction, that opens up the market hmm. for these things to every country on earth. They can have, they can produce whatever they want, whether it be an energy carrier like hydrogen or ammonia. Produce that in the middle of the ocean where it's cheap, yeah. 
and then transport that back to them. And all they need is a port to launch from. Hmm. So it's not just, you know, energy security for nations, but it's security for the Bitcoin network. Think of it like your appendix. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if you still have your appendix. Do you? I do. You do? Yeah. I have mine. Do you have I yours? I have mine, yeah. <clears throat> well, the function of the appendix, everybody thinks, oh, it's this you know, useless little appendage. No. No, it's that enclave for your bacteria, your gut bacteria. There's a catastrophic, you know, loss of your gut. You know, the mm-hmm. gut is the most important, it's the second brain of mm-hmm. the human. Mm-hmm. And if there's a catastrophic loss and your body has to shed it, well, what's there to repopulate? That's where the appendix come in. Because it's closed off from the rest of it, it's not going to, it's not going to be part of that flush. Hmm. And it can really, it's kind of like Ireland functions for the DNA of Europe, right? It's appended. <laughs> Ireland didn't get hit by the Black Plague. If, there, if everybody in Europe was wiped out, mm, the Ireland DNA, would <laughs> Ireland would repopulate. Yeah. It's, huh. Ireland is the appendix. Of the- <laughs> <laughs> and, and so to, to kind of wrap this up, you know, obviously we hope that never happens, right? We yeah. don't want, you know, Bitcoin mining to be shut down across the board. And obviously there will be home miners there, but at what percentage of hash rate uh, and how much will yeah. they be able to get to where at a, you know, utility scale OTEC plants um, really provide that backup, that, put that, that appendix option if that were to ever hmm. happen. So... Again, a little bit, little bit uh, uh, far off, and we don't want to, we never want to see that future happen, but it's just one more level of robustness potentially to that decentralization of the mining on the Bitcoin network. Interesting. Yeah. It's, yeah. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Exactly. Obviously. Um, you know, this makes me think of other digital only businesses that have had a lot of jurisdictional arbitrage, like. Bitmex, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. A regulator would come down on them in one jurisdiction, so they would just, they're all digital, right? Even their capital, everything. They would just switch to another jurisdiction. Yep. But you're describing that same or similar dynamic, but in actual physical space. Yep. Yeah. Um, and there's, I've analogized some of that in my writing too, that I called it the digital high seas, right? Once you get onto Bitcoin, <laughs> you're kind of out, you're extra legal in a way. You're outside of legal frameworks and you can just choose which one treats you best from a physical standpoint. This is actually codified in the, by the UN. But this is the physical... Ver- yeah. I was analogizing digital space to the high seas, but now you're talking about taking the advantages of digital space by actually physically being... Yeah. Op- physically operating in the, the high seas. Super fascinating stuff. Um, and then overall, this would just make state... It would just make the Bitcoin network more robust to state attack, right? Because... It it's more expensive to tyrannize things that are yeah. scattered all over the so equatorial it also has lower ocean. Energy costs. So, you know, at, for the 10 megawatt, you have to have the Bitcoin mining is going to be the first buyer of this energy. Mm. But now, what you can do with Bitcoin mining is let's say there's a, you know, an offshore manganese nodule mining operation that requires, say, 50 megawatts, right? Well, the cost, if I was to build a 50 megawatt OTEC plant, that cost of energy is going to be higher than the cost of energy for a 100 megawatt OTEC plant. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is I can get that manganese nodule mining operation, the power cost of a 100 megawatt plant, even though they only need 50, and use that other 50 to mine Bitcoin. Mm. So I can guarantee 100% of my energy is generating revenue 100% of the time. Hmm. If you thought <clears throat> playing whack-a-mole, you know, on shutting down stuff was difficult on land, which uh-huh, it is, uh-huh. uh, it costs the tyrannizing, tyrannizing people obviously goes right. up, right? They can't shut down the Somali pirates. Like That's the reason, that's the reason they're international waters, right? Otherwise, they would be claimed as U.S. waters or Chinese mm-hmm. waters, whatever it is. But they're international because it's not cost-efficient to tax people that are that far out to sea and control It's the them. wealth of the world. Yeah. You know, where, is, where, where do you draw the border? In the ocean, right? In, yeah. On land, you know, we generally use a, you know, a river or yeah. a yeah. mountain range. Yeah. Right. To, or for U.S. and Canada, yeah. 
For us, the ocean. <laughs> for us, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> for us, it's the ocean, right? Yeah. 200 kilometers out. Yeah. That's the that's the line. You know how you can gamble in the in the ocean. You know they have the river boats mm-hmm. that go out in states. Um, yeah. You know, but two hundred kilometers out. Yeah, duty free purchases, all this stuff. Interesting. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Crowd Health. Crowd Health is a Bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it. Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. And I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download this state-of-the-art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Masterworks. Masterworks gives you access to the fine art market at more affordable price points. They do this by offering you fractional shares in their $500 million portfolio of fine art. Now, fine art is an alternative asset class, and historically, it's been a great performer and a really good hedge against inflation. Most investors typically hold anywhere from 2 to 10% of their assets in an asset like fine art. To sign up or learn more, go to masterworks.com and use promo code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code breedlove and so how maybe you don't know this how oceans cover 70 percent of earth's surface approximately what percentage of that is this equatorial no wave region do you have any so idea? the equatorial is going to be it's the intertropical convergence zone the itcz and that's from five north to five south okay but the OTEC zone itself <coughs> the is O-tech 23. Zone. Yeah, you can yeah. mine it. You right. can use this energy source, you know, cost effectively in, you know, from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer, right? The mm-hmm. entire tropical zone. And so when you look at the energy distribution on planet Earth, right? All of our, basically everything the Earth had uh, was already here for the last few billion years. Mm-hmm. The only thing, the only new input that we're getting comes from the sun. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at the amount of solar irradiance across the planet that the Earth receives, right, which of course is the definition of a Kardashev level one mm-hmm. society, because you're, you know, it, it, the sun really sees the Earth as a big flat disk. Mm-hmm. And that tropical zone is the largest part, right? So... The tropics make up on that flat disk Earth that the sun sees 50% of all the land. Now, 80% of the tropics is covered in water. So Mm -hmm. that means 40% of all the energy inputs to planet Earth 
I'm being strike wasted. the middle of the ocean where there is no in where the energy is cheapest, mm -hmm. where the the largest source of energy on planet Earth, mm -hmm. there is absolutely no activity. Wow. And there's only one way to get it. And and the fact of water <coughs> being the best solar panel out there. You should hit in yeah. on this because mm -hmm. this is mind blowing. The you know, we spend all this money and do all this this, you know, resource extraction to simulate what water can do. But mm. water has the highest heat capacity of any of any material. Hmm. It absorbs energy and holds it overnight. It's why it's not freezing cold at night. Hmm. Right? You know, on you, you go to the desert inland, you were just in Vegas, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it can be, you know, boiling hot in the day and freezing cold at night out in the mm -hmm. desert. Well, in the ocean, no. Right. The, the water holds that energy. So at the end of the day, OTEC is a solar concentration technique hmm. and using the water to concentrate that solar energy and then using the planet's motion itself to cool it, right? When water, you know, the way that heat is distributed on planet Earth, the sun strikes the tropical oceans when it's nice and warm. That water flows, you know, you, Florida and mm -hmm, the Gulf mm -hmm. Stream, right? Mm -hmm. That warm water from the tropics flows up to the poles where it gets very cold mm. and it sinks down to the bottom mm. of the ocean hmm. and then it flows back all the way around the world's oceans back and it ends in the Pacific. So the earth is bringing that cold, is cooling the water and bringing it back to the tropics. Hmm. So you're talking about leveraging what's already existent in nature, right? That we already have this ultimate solar panel in the ocean. Yep. And then we have an earth that's in perpetual motion that's driving these, what, Thermo flows? Thermohaline circulation. <laughs> Thermohaline circulation, yep. new term there. <laughs> and so we're really just positioning ourselves to benefit from that natural flow of energy versus trying to recreate it artificially with solar panels or other technologies. But if you want to do solar panels, manganese nodules are the, yeah. are the key to that. <laughs> okay, well, what's a manganese nodule? Uh -oh. Dare I ask. There Robert, be careful. <laughs> your phone, your computer are made out of minerals, right? Uh -huh. You know, there's a bunch of them in there. There are these, there are trillions of balls of metal, solid metal balls that are just sitting on the floor of the ocean. Over 4.5 million square kilometers just littered. The ocean is just littered with these things. And they contain all the mineral resources we need to build the solar panels, mm. the batteries, the phones, everything humanity needs. And the only re we've known about these things for 70 years. In the oceanographic community, this is like half of the <laughs> classes I have to take mm -hmm. are about these man these fucking manganese, manganese nodules. nodules. Mm -hmm. And the only reason we don't go get them is because at the moment, child slave labor in the Congo and paying Boko Haram to do mm -hmm. it over there is a little bit cheaper. Mm -hmm. And again, the only reason it is cheaper is because marine diesel prices it out. Mm -hmm. Industrial scale mining operations take a lot of energy. Right. So that cost for marine diesel and sh you know shipping it out there to the middle of the ocean constantly costs a lot of money. And we did we ran the numbers on one of these yesterday. It's like over like a twenty year lifespan, you're saving you know six hundred thirty million dollars by wow. using OTEC. And so we can tip that balance, that economic balance, and we can. I mean, we're going to put a lot of child yeah. slave labor out of business, and, you know, but... Ar artisanal. Artisanal mines is the, gotcha. the term you're going to see in, in the media uh, for where you're, the cobalt, everything. I mean, look, I'm guilty of it as well, too. I got but, uh, I got solar panels. Right. And remember, you have that base... Because OTEC has that mobile capability, right, you can move it along and your the energy is right there right it's as 
that you don't have to ship it mm-hmm. to the source where you're extracting this. You can follow along. Um, so that's one of those use cases that we're talking about. And coming back to the pioneer species, right? We start out with the Bitcoin mining, really prove out that this is, you know, for the first time in history, cracking this pilot monetization problem. Mm-hmm. And then all of these use cases, which exist out there already, already, which people know about, but just haven't been able to solve this because they never took this very unique approach with Bitcoin and they don't have the technical whereabouts or the Harman cycle and so mm-hmm. forth now start to pop up. I mean, we're talking with some of these companies and they're like, holy crap, I never thought that anyone would actually have a viable approach to doing this. And wow. now it's it's uh, it's coming out. And the, I won't name names, but these are the Fortune you know, 100 type companies yeah. that are coming out of the woodwork. Half of our team is 70 years old. <laughs> huh. like, we're the young faces, huh. but the other half are like people who've been working on this whole their whole career. Yeah. And they're coming out of the woodwork saying, holy shit, yeah. you just came up with a third solution to this problem that... We've been banging our heads against a wall for our entire yeah. careers. Wow. Wow. So are we, when you describe putting child labor operations out of business, <laughs> is that essentially a positive externality of just cheaper energy that you're you're harnessing via this kind of natural cycle? Yeah. There's, and I mean, the, the positive externalities of this energy source are boundless. I mean, you can... We can we can start getting we can start we can start going crazy uh, with well, enough we, of these around the globe. You can cool the earth. I was gonna say cheaper energy in general is almost equivalent to just having more wealth because when you have yeah. cheaper en- energy is the number one input to every industrial operation. So if you make energy cheaper, you make um, output higher, mm-hmm. basically, right? You're increasing aggregate wealth on the planet. Energy is the fundamental driver of human prosperity, mm-hmm. right? And uh, that is a core belief that we have. I think growing up in the U.S. specifically, we take that for granted. Mm-hmm. Um, growing up in the developed or descending world, as someone put mm-hmm. it, like we take that for granted. But I mean, it's it is uh, it is fundamental to human prosperity, right? Mm-hmm. And there's use cases as small as, you know, the dishwasher mm-hmm. to as large as, uh, you know, building, you know, space, space right? Like with with uh, more energy, we can solve and enough human ingenuity and sound money. Mm-hmm. Shit, you mm-hmm. want really long chain hydrocarbons? Fuck, I'll run a Sabatier reaction on board <laughs> with cheap enough energy, you know, because the these costs, unlike fossil fuels, which keep getting more and more expensive, mm-hmm. over time, OTEC gets cheaper and cheaper. And hmm. at some point, it will be cheap enough to where we can run a Sabatier reaction. You know, we can run a Fisher trope. We can make synthetic fossil, you know, synthetic hydrocarbon fuel. Hmm. And then just ship it to land. So using this mining operation to then make synthetic fuels yeah from the carbon in the atmosphere pull it out of the atmosphere and make a synthetic hydrocarbon because you know people make the this people make this you know false dichotomy they equate fossil fuels with organic chemistry Uh no 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 fossil fuels are just outsourcing our labor to you know creatures that lived 300 million years ago. Right. We can do uh, we can do those same organic chemistry reactions. The only difference is that you need cheap energy. Cheap energy. Wow. That reminds me I had Jeff Booth on a long time ago for a series and he made that point that you know ocean desalination tech already exists and then the technology to decarbonize <laughs> the air also already exists. But it's just a matter of having cheaper energy to scale. Desal, them. Yeah. yeah, no. So desal. So Nate mentioned, and you should dive into this a little bit more. But Nate mentioned closed cycle OTEC, which is what you know we're going to be running early on, and is the best way for us to really get this pilot up and get the initial mm-hmm. plants running. But there's open cycle and and hybrid cycle OTEC as well, and 
dum dum dum, it happens to be that desalinated water is a uh, byproduct. byproduct. Hmm. And desalinated water wow. was actually proposed as one of the solutions, along with hydrogen, to solving this OTEC pilot monetization problem. We're going to sell desalinated water, we're going to sell hydrogen off, and at the scale that they were doing that, it actually just made both processes more expensive due to efficiencies, Mm -hmm. due to a bunch of different things. We We won't nerd out too much here, but... I mean, again, this is where, you know, thank God for Bitcoin that it came in and mm-hmm. it just makes us easy. Nate, you too. Desalinated water as a byproduct of producing energy. And that's not the only byproduct. Passive. Passively. Passive. On the back end. We're mm-hmm. talking about, you know, no extra cost. It co- Of course, the open cycle uh, plant costs more to build than a closed cycle plant, but you produce water out the back end. Mm -hmm. Now, with closed cycle, our byproduct is sucking carbon out of the atmosphere Mm -hmm. and exporting it to death. You know, we talked about this thermohaline solution, uh, you know, um, circulation. Mm -hmm. So it runs from the North Atlantic where it sinks down and travels all the way around the world's ocean back to the Pacific. Now, all along that path, there's things at the surface that are growing, living, dying, and sinking down. Mm. So those the nutrients of all those dead, you know, we call it detritus in the science Carbon-based life forms. But the, you know, the term everyone's familiar yeah. with is shit rolls downhill, yeah. right? Yeah. And so that shit, detritus is the fancy mm. word, accumulates in this, this deeper water. So when we pump it up to the surface and release it, well, things are going to come eat it, mm. right? So phytoplankton are going to be seeded out of the back end. Again, this is just the return flow. Mm. We don't have to pay any extra money to do this. Mm-hmm. We're and when they when those phytoplankton grow from the nutrients in our outflow, they pull carbon from the atmosphere and the upper ocean, and then when they die, they fall back down, hmm. taking that carbon with them. And then of course there's the zooplankton that come and eat the phytoplankton, and the krill that come and eat them, and then the bigger and bigger. And so with enough of these, you're creating a open ocean. Hmm. You could reseed the ocean with life. I mean, we just watched the collapse of the snow crab population like this year. No more all-you-can-eat crab legs this season, guys. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, we can reseed the life in the ocean. You know, we've wow. overfished the easy fish, right? All the fish, and we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper hmm. and fishing them out. We can, with enough of these, we can. We see the ocean. A lot wow. of positive externalities. Right? Yeah. And byproducts. Yeah, cheap energy is wealth, and wealth is almost by definition solutions to problems, right? The more wealth you have, the more problems you can solve. Crazy to think about. Like, Okay, so let's pivot a little bit here. <laughs> Impact of the broken fiat system on misallocating <coughs> capital, right? We know yeah. we talk about this a lot in Bitcoin circles. Bad price signals lead to badly allocated capital, leads to bad projects, leads to recessions, boom and bust. This is all 1940s Mises playing out today pretty uh, spectacularly. So what does OTEC have to do with that? How is it actually driving technological engineering progress away from high time preference investments to lower time preference value investments so i think this is a little bit meta but one of the things that nate and i are definitely seeing as we go out and uh kind of evaluate the investment landscape as we work and you know are building long-term partnerships with with funds and so forth um luckily we've just been able to meet some of the incredible ones but having worked in silicon valley and built you know a few startups from scratch to you know larger exits, you know, I've seen over the past decade, um, this, this appetite to kind of go in and, and just fund these 
really shit companies, right? And we're seeing it play out right now as well with the uh, the drama. Will I get in trouble? The drama around FTX no. and a lot of the stuff that's that's happening is there's just been um, money has been easy. Mm-hmm. Everyone is looking for that two-year markup so they can raise their next fund from their LP. I mean, you know mm-hmm. this very well, mm-hmm. given your background of, of kind of what goes on. Um, raise their markup and uh, and invest in, and try to make a quick buck mm-hmm. or invest in just very low, low impact, I'll call them, technologies that um, they dump a lot of cash in to have, you know, rapid user growth and then try to sell to Google or whatever. Mm-hmm. And what we are, uh, what we're seeing now is obviously the unwinding, right? Due to the Fed raising their interest rates mm-hmm. and uh, capital is obviously becoming more expensive again. Um, and this boom and bust cycle is actually really, really fucking bad for this low time preference, long term thinking that yeah. we need as a species. To be order to, to to be able to build, you know these mega projects or really impactful technologies, mm. um, and I and I really think it's like a shame. And this is where Nate and I kind of first started, you know, connected over, a, and is that like we need to be working on the big picture stuff, and if we're in these boom and bust cycles, and which leads to this high time preference thing, we're never going to be able to just focus and look and say, what is Mm. the world going to look like in a hundred years? And what's the actual steady path to building that Mm. top of cycle? Everyone wants a quick buck bottom of cycle. Everyone's screwed and no one wants to actually like allocate to Mm long-term projects. Um, except for, you know, a few very incredible people that, you know, have the mindset. And one Mm. of the beautiful things, you know, we got to hang out with, with you and others uh, a few weeks back here in LA and you see the way that um, the sailors and the Weisses and very other people think about this in like 20, 30 year terms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we just feel like that's so important. And there's other technologies out there, whether it be nuclear, or whether it be other projects that are being worked on. And we hope <coughs> that, um, you know, that what we're doing and what some of these other companies are doing will really inspire people, hopefully, to focus on these long-term things. And that the Bitcoin standard can't come soon enough because mm. we got to get out of this shit mm. or else we're going to s- continue to see the same results that we have since 71. Mm. And it's fossil fuel, mm. right? Fossil fuels is fiat. <laughs> the entire fiat system we live in today, I mean, it's called the petrodollar, <laughs> Right. <laughs> It few easy access to hydrocarbons, right, are just like fiat, you know, fiat money, where it's really easy to get, and so it leads to misallocation of capital. We've known that fossil fuels are just going to get more and more expensive. As, as you know, there's no more, there's no more, you know, giant plots of Texas and Saudi Arabia where the oil is just gushing out right. of the fucking We're ground. We're digging no. deeper and deeper. Deeper, yeah. more expensive harder to get at and in the you know the developed world we had access to that and you know we put our money our money printer to work and destabilizing the middle east to so that we had exclusive access Mm -hmm. to that saudi that sweet crude baby Mm -hmm. and you know and we knew that was going to run out we've known that you know Climate change has gonna is going to happen. We've known that for 150 years, right? Mm-hmm. The fossil fuel companies knew about it since the 60s and 70s. And instead of investing in the future of humanity, we say, well, this is easy money. <laughs> I can make a trillion dollars with the Saudis and, you know, chop people's heads off and mm-hmm. cut them up and, uh, <laughs> and put them in bags, take them out. Mm-hmm. Um Instead of investing in these long, this long-term infrastructure that will benefit humanity, right? And so fiat and fossil fuels are, are the same, same, same problem. And Bitcoin changes that because Bitcoin mining, at the end of the day, profitability from Bitcoin mining is solely dependent on the marginal cost of the energy source, mm-hmm. right? Unlike fossil fuels and fiat where 
that that marginal cost isn't really the main driver now and so when you think about marginal cost of energy source well oil and gas you have to pull it out of the ground you have to refine it you have to transport it right there's all these extra steps which cause that cost to go up mm -hmm. but with it cost us nothing for the sun to shine or the wind to blow or the geotherm mm -hmm. or in our case the ocean to thermal. Mm. Right? We don't have to pay for that. Mm. So it can achieve that zero marginal cost energy source, which is mm. what the human humanity needs. Mm. And yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, <coughs> Nate comes, Nate and I come from this from, you know, he, he has this background in, in um, uh, you know, in geochemistry and so forth, which is really fascinating. Did a, a great pod with Peter on this. I come from, I think, slightly more of the background of where I just want, you know, I just want that energy prosperity right mm -hmm. and we should do whatever we can to just maximize that mm -hmm. and it's going to take long-term bets right mm -hmm. like nuclear france didn't build nuclear overnight power 80 percent of their country and mm -hmm. so we need a um whether you're a uh a hydro or fossil hydrocarbon fossil fuel maximalist a gas guy whatever it is, like, we should all want to expand the pie. It's mm -hmm. not a zero-sum mm -hmm. game. When I, I wanted to check back in with you, just given your background and, and get your thoughts from the investment perspective of this boom and bust cycle and, and how you've seen that effect because you've seen this firsthand for the last decade plus. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm a young man. I'm only 37, youngish, I guess. Oh, yeah. Um, but the... When you look at the bust historically, yeah. the volatility is increasing, right? So the most recent liquidity crisis we had in March 2020, it was the fastest drawdown in market history. It was faster than 1929's collapse. So I, what, I mean, the way I look at it is you're just pumping in a lot of noise into what's meant to be the pricing signal system. Yeah. There's a lot of confusion, so you're... You're throwing human action into disarray. Capital is being put not to its highest and best use. Yeah. Uh, production structures aren't adapting quickly to changes in consumer preferences, and so that that just fucks up the whole economy. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's so obvious when you understand it that way because if you want to screw up any complex system, just screw up its internal means of communication. Right? It can't yeah. adapt. It can't reconfigure itself as reality changes, and that's exactly what we're doing when we debase the currency. Yeah. So I haven't lived through a lot of the. I mean, I lived through two thousand eight. I lived through twenty twenty. Yeah. Uh, I mean, only three. I lived know, through dot com too, but I was a kid. At, oh, I was a fourteen, fifteen yeah. years old at the time. So, um, yeah, but three in a lifetime, <laughs> right? This and and by the way, and the Fed's exclusive purpose is to smooth the business cycle, yeah. steady prices, low unemployment, but it Good actually job. does. The exact opposite, of course. Well, and then Good you job, have Jay. inflation as well, which raises that uh, that hurdle rate, right? <clears throat> yeah, um, and induces people into riskier investments. Yeah. And so, buy my Google widget. Give me twenty right. million dollars for right. a Google widget. Right. Well, now what's happening is people are. If you were to go in and sit with a fund uh, in the mid twenty teens, or even at kind of once the market's recovered from the initial COVID shock, especially in the anything that touches the crypto space, it was really like, fucking take our money, right? Mm -hmm. And now what's happened is if you go out, um, I would say probably 80 to 90% of the investors, the thing that they're caring about more than anything right now is really payback period and being able to, they're preparing for economic downturn. Mm -hmm. They need to, mm -hmm. to, to see those marks, right, mm -hmm. on their book. Um, and so again, we're at this kind of bottoming of the cycle mm -hmm. and people are scared as shit to invest in long-term projects. And I, I mean, it, it's just so simple. And it, for me, it's just so frustrating. Um, again, having read the Mises, having mm -hmm. and understanding this stuff that this is a just primary fucking blocker of us making it to this next step yeah. in humanity and it's a self-destructive tendency mm -hmm. it's horrible. Right. It's we're, horrible. we're we're cutting off our nose to spite our face when we're printing money and thinking it's going to solve problems 
I, I describe this a lot as this the recurrent self-deception of humanity. Like people keep yeah. thinking we can create new slips of paper over here or equivalent database entries, and that somehow creates more real goods and services in the real world. Like yeah. it's so fucking stupid. Like yeah. if you're hungry, you don't go print a bunch of sheets of paper and say, I made more money, now I can buy sandwiches. You make more sandwiches, right? Yeah. Like you, I don't know. It just it's a point of frustration, but um, I guess it's also an opportunity to educate people about the nature of all this stuff. Okay, the impact on humanity that mastering the ocean's energy leads to. What do you mean by that? What is it? What is this? This sounds very important. So I'll kick it off, and then I think Nate will have a bunch of interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, again, he's an oceanographer. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, he, he he knows this better than anyone. So. One of the, the kind of the things that we talk about a lot and when we're talking with partners or uh, investors and so forth is um, this concept of this like new frontier on the ocean, right? Everyone's looking to space. We're looking really out to the ocean. I mean, we'll have spaceports, but we're looking out there. And if you look back throughout history and especially the, just say the last 500 years or so or 600 years, all the major empires were built on uh, the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. So let's think through. You have Portugal, right? Yeah. You have Spain. Um, you have the Dutch. You have the British. The and Vikings. The U.S. Yeah. yeah. The Vikings going even further back. Yeah. He who controls the waves controls Carthage, the world. Carthage, Rome. Yeah. yeah. Built on the all built on the ocean. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there's a, a quote by, God, I'm going to uh, mess up his name. But yeah, he who commands the seas commands everything. Yeah. Um, it was an Athenian uh, Athenian general. And it actually, one of the interesting things that I know you talk about this is this drive for kind of trade and so forth mm -hmm. and commerce. And that's where, for example, with Portuguese, it was they were looking to go get spice, right? Mm -hmm. And find new trade routes. And they've ended up, ended up just... Um, mastering more and more of it and alluding kind of i think or looking at your sailor series when he talked about these roman military advancements mm -hmm. the engineering that's what happened in almost all of these cases where there was a breakthrough technology right whether it was um uh mapping or navigation mm -hmm. tools or boat design combined with applying that to the 70 percent right of the world's surface mm -hmm that drove those empires forward, mm -hmm. right? It was this combination of the ocean and a new new form of technology, mm -hmm. technology engineering, whatever that, uh, however you'd want to describe it, that led to this domination. And now where we're at today, the reason why the US, right, as a empire is so dominant is because we control all of these commerce yes. routes. Yeah. Um, and tying that back in the ocean bit, and Nate, I'll let you riff for a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm still in the mic, but tying that back in is that, um, well, you know, I, we don't want to be looked at like, you know, dominating and owning everything. There's a world out there for everyone. Um, by building out ocean bit and really mastering ocean thermal energy, right? Energy, which we talked about as primary driver, um, we see this potential for really, we look at what we're doing as empire building in mm -hmm. a positive sense, not just building out a technology and so forth, but building this platform for the next empire, which we believe will have large part in mm -hmm. the ocean. Do you know what the first open ocean navigation civilization was? Uh, what jumps to mind is like the Peloponnesians, but I'm not sure. Polynesians. Polynesians. The Polynesians, Sorry. right? Yeah. You, Mispronounced, but that's what I meant, I think. <laughs> and, you know, these guys discovered ocean, how to, you know, navigate not just any open ocean, right? The Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. out there. Right. A thousand years before the next society, the Vikings, right? Right. These guys were actively trading, navigating between Hawaii and New Zealand. Wow. Like... Like, I get goosebumps thinking about yeah. how lucky we are that they were okay with where they were. Because if they had been resource scarce, yeah. like the Vikings were, right? Yeah. They had they did it out of necessity. These guys did it because it was, you know, it was their life, mm -hmm. right? That's yeah. they, they built, these people lived on the ocean. Mm -hmm. They did it out of, you know, love. 
versus the Vikings had to do it. So if the Pol Polynesians, you know, I always like to think that the Polynesian, we only exist today in the world by the good graces of the Polynesians, <laughs> not conquering everybody. <laughs> you know, with a thousand years, you know, with a thousand years of active development of technology, especially mm -hmm. building on top of that sea, they could have conquered the, the whole world. world. The yeah. whole world. The Vikings, you know, they left Northern Europe living, you know, scrounging around the dirt and the mm -hmm. dust. You can't grow anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they ended up in China. Mm -hmm. How the hell did they do? Ocean power. Yeah. You know, the Romans... Uh, well, the Car Carthaginians were invented, you know, real travel across the Mediterranean, and the Romans realized that, so they went, they found a ship, they stole the technology, built a fleet, mm -hmm. tried to cross to kill the Carthaginians, well, that shit, that fleet sank, mm -hmm. so they built another one, and then that one sank, so then they built two more fleets, and finally... You know, and that, that's really how Rome gained power. And then even looking towards the, you know, like, sort of fictional world, and uh, you're familiar with the Dune series? Mm -hmm, yeah, I've seen the newest Dune movie. How I don't think House I watched the answer. How did Atreides really build their power? I don't recall. On the ocean, on Caladan, mm. they conquered their planet. It was a water planet. Mm. They conquered their planet on the ocean didn't destroy it unlike House Harkonnen, and used that ocean as a jumping point to then, of course, conquer space. Mm -hmm. And so to continue on that riff, you know, one of the problems with commercial space travel right now is, one, the launch cost, mm -hmm. but, well, where are you putting your spaceport? So, mm -hmm. you know, SpaceX has Boca Chica, right, in Texas. Well, you can't launch rockets over people's heads because Splody die, right? Splody die. They explode and everybody dies <laughs> underneath. Now, yeah. China doesn't have that problem, so they launch rockets over people's heads. Yeah. But, you know, we can't do that. And it costs an incredible amount of money permitting time i mean elon's going through this thing with the epa right now because it's a you know a preserve a turtle preserve and they have to shut down the highway for these people who live in the area and they can only launch a certain a few days out of the year yeah. and a few time you know a few hours out of the day well it turns out that the single best place to launch ships from or you know spaceships from is the equator and, you know, I've watched his Falcon 9s land on barges. So, well, an equatorial floating spaceport where you can produce the fuel you need on site, access to deep water port with 360 degree launch trajectories. Hmm. You don't have to deal with the EPA. You hmm. don't have to deal with the FAA. You can launch any time of day, any time of night. Not going to kill anybody if it explodes. Mm. It is the ideal. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, so to wrap, I think the, or to just tie up and bow up this concept of, you know, the ocean em empire, and I'm not even going to pronounce the word uh, that we were talking about earlier. It's a, thal th Nate, say it one time. Thalassocras... <laughs> Thalassocracy? Yeah, there's a word for it. Thalassocracy. Thalassocracy. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thalassocracy. The, um... A state with primarily maritime realms, an empire at sea, yeah. or a seaborne empire. So uh, instead of, you know, there, there is a, a technology and engineering innovation, right, which is OTEC, and obviously Bitcoin being this Thing that drives and really pulls a renewable energy source for the first time not tacking on to the back of one mm -hmm. but really pulling this source into existence mm -hmm, from mm -hmm. the r d stages so you have this technology applied to the ocean instead of conquering other peoples and other nations and so forth we're actually conquering the energy harnessing the energy mm. 
and building and laying the framework for a new empire of these ocean industries and use cases that we believe will blossom. And whether, colonizing whether, it. Yeah, whether mm-hmm. that be, you know, floating seasteading, uh, new communities mm-hmm. out there, whether it be truck stops, as Nate likes to talk about, whether it be seabed mineral mining, so we Where no there is longer energy. have to go into the Congo. Mm-hmm. There is life. Right. If you have an energy source, you can live. You can make water. Mm-hmm. These things are going to be open ocean fisheries, so you have all the poke yeah. you can eat, right? right. Yeah. right. Uh, you know, just right off board. You can survive, and that's... We've been... What's you the know, point here, right? We're all trying to survive and increase the carrying capacity of the planet. 70% of the, yeah. of the exactly. planet is nobody's living on. Right. But with energy, you change that. And so this seems to be like an extension of that enterprise where we're putting ships out to sea, we're using, we're leveraging the buoyancy of water and the wind that's naturally blowing to move things at a much much lower cost, things or ourselves. Yeah. It's a lower friction movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's what gives, that's what allows us to economize (laughs) our actions that we can, when you can move more cheaply, you can move more things, you can drive more trade. More division of labor, more wealth creation, all the things. Historically, has been, I think, roughly 10% is the number that I've seen most commonly quoted. And, you know, like if you're in the Roman days, right, it was a matter of marching troops. But in these days, you know, you have barge sizes as well and economies of scale and so mm-hmm. forth. There's just, it's just a fascinating, fascinating space that's overlooked by most people. And, some people look up to the stars. Some people look out to the horizon. Well, and it's an, again, that would be an extension, too. If we master this low-friction environment, yep. then maybe we're better equipped to master that low-friction environment, which is space, space elevator. zero-friction environment. Space elevator. The only place right. to put it is in the middle of the ocean at the equator. Hmm. It, it's the wow. only way to reduce the launch you know, cost of getting things up to space by two orders of magnitude to wow. make it actually economical to start thinking about space wow okay so i think this segues nicely into our last point which is bitcoin plus otec creating an abundant energy source and a driver of the human species towards a kardashev type one and then a type two civilization can we define those please yeah and tell me how that plays out so kardashev Type 1 civilization, right? The Kardashev scale was invented by this guy, you know, this Soviet scientist, Kardashev, back in the 60s. And it, you know, it it was a way to um, classify civilizations based on energy use alone, right? Mm -hmm. The more energy a civilization, you know, space civilization uses, the more advanced they are, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, And that makes... Which, again, is equivalent to saying they're richer, they're wealthier, yeah, yeah. right? Exactly. They're harnessing more energy. <clears throat> it's a larger collective life form at that exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah. And so a type 1 civilization is defined by the total irradiance that the Earth receives, or your home planet, mm-hmm. in, you know, the general case, the home planet receives from its home star. And so in our case, you know, you take the, that flat disk Earth and you shine a light on it, how much, you know, solar energy is hitting Mm -hmm. the face of the planet. And like I said, 40% of that is only accessible through OTEC. So there is no future for humanity that does not include OTEC in a meaningful capacity. Now, type 2 is defined by the entire output of your home star. Mm. So in a, you know, Dyson Swarm or Dyson Sphere Mm. sort of thing um and like you know you have to get to car we if we don't get to kardashev level one which fossil fuels can never do right there's not enough of them to supply the world i mean even right now they failed with the the you know giving the developed world energy they've had 150 years to do it and fossil fuels have failed miserably because there are people living who don't have access to energy Mm. they say they're gonna do it they want another 150 years (laughs) Bullshit. Hmm. We don't have enough of it to, to accommodate two, three, four orders of magnitude more energy on these hydrocarbons mm. because the costs keep going up. 
people can't afford them as is. So Kardashev type one then is harnessing all the energy that hits the face of your planet at, over any time period, I guess, a it day just, or a year. It's constant, right. you know, the constant stream of energy. But you could be harnessing that by any means necessary, right? So in theory, if you had enough hydrocarbons to do that, you'd still be Kardashev type one without harnessing solar energy. If in theory, I'm not saying it's yeah. actually possible. If you had enough. Just trying to distinguish what the scale actually means. It's how much energy you are using. Yeah. yeah. And so Kardashev type two would be harnessing all the output of the star itself. So yeah. all the energy that's coming off the surface of the sun we are harnessing. So that would be a one, stretch goal, obviously. Type yeah. <laughs> 1 is 2 times 10 to the 17th watts. Okay. Is Where it, are we today? We are, so it's a log scale. Yeah. So we are 0.73, which is 2 times 10 to the 13th or 14th. So we have a few orders of magnitude left to go. Oh, okay. So we're three-ish orders of magnitude from, yeah. the, okay. Yeah. I didn't think we were that close. Uh, and for the record, when he's saying flat disc for you flat earth people, it's not the, the same thing. I just want to put that yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just yeah. how you, you, know. you look at it. <clears throat> it's just the face of the sphere that's facing the sun. Exactly. Send him your hate mail, not yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then getting to that scale, I mean, really, it seems like pursuing that scale is perhaps the most important thing we can do yep. as a civilization because you're, again, harnessing more energy, which is equivalent to creating more wealth, which is equivalent to solving more problems, which is equivalent to satisfying more human wants, yep. which is equivalent to increasing the carrying capacity of the planet. So if, if human flourishing is our metric, then this is the scale we should be operating by. Yep. Uh, but we can't progress up this scale without the technology we're discussing today. Yeah, it's impossible. Uh, and if we don't achieve that scale, that's a nightmare situation because it means we've run into the Great Bill thing. The Malthusian wall kind of thing. And it means that humanity will never get to the stars, which means right. we will die. We will live. Everybody will live and die on this planet. Right. And humanity will yeah. be extinguished. If we, don't get, if we don't move forward, the only way... There's no staying still for humanity. We either so move forward or we collapse. So there it is, Bitcoin or extinction. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, Yeah. <laughs> we choose. And Bitcoin yeah. is the key. Yeah. Bitcoin is the fucking key. You can have all the energy in the world, I think, as well. And without the that sound money part, right, without it being actually the two being linked, Right. Uh, it's, it's like, you know, turning on the AC on full, or a leaky funnel, turning on right. the AC on full blast and opening up the door. Like, you can produce, I mean, great example of this, where I've, I've spent some time a couple years ago is Venezuela, like all the capacity for energy creation, money destroyed their, what they did with their money supply destroyed that. And, and they have massive energy reserves. Massive like energy reserves. Top five on earth, I think. But you've, I mean, the two have this such an intimate relationship. And so when that, breaks down then the, that means a production of the yeah of the of that self-destruction you know. exactly yeah because to your point we could harness a ton of energy but if we're going out and waging world war three with it then it's kind of self-defeating right yeah. we yep. project a lot of power we raise a lot of capital destroy a lot of capital we're kind of if you know, we better a lot off of energy and we're going to alter the long-term hydrological cycle of humanity, mm -hmm. right? The bigger we are, the more connected we are, the more that disruptions to food production in some small region that no one's ever heard of start to affect everyone else, mm -hmm. right? And our entire agricultural sector is based and at its core is this long-term hydrological cycle. It rains here, on average, a certain amount of inches a year. That makes it perfect to grow corn or mm -hmm. coffee or, mm -hmm. or alfalfa, in, since we're in California, or pistachios, right? Except for it's not perfect to grow it here, and it's a huge problem. But changing those long-term hydro, hydrological cycles through anthropogenic climate change will lead... There are three... 3.2 to 3.6 billion people who live in areas that will be affected by mm. this if we do nothing about it. Mm. And 
OTEC is doing something a fucking mm. about it. So yeah, there's huge <coughs> incentive structure to create more cheap and abundant energy, and then you can transact that energy. Not exactly transacting the energy, but you can alchemize it into digital gold. The digital gold, very hard to steal with coercion or violence, so you're sort of disincentivizing warfare on one end, or you're simultaneously uh, putting upward pressure on innovation through lowering energy costs, which is the input to every industrial operation. You can connect these things to land. And, it, you know, right. at the large scale, you do connect these things to land and power civilization. Yeah. And if you string... Uh, you know, uh, if you daisy chain a bunch of these OTEC platforms, plant ships across the equator, you can create super grids, yeah. right? You can't just run a long cable from one continent to the other because there's going to be so much loss in between. But if you have power plants mm -hmm. daisy chained together, amplifying each other, now you can connect the world. So the big grand vision here is, I mean, this ties into a lot of the Bitcoin vision itself, but there's more wealth, uh, less, we have less, um, more wealth, but less fighting over the wealth, I'll which is kind of the Bitcoin building. piece. Yeah, building versus conquering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We start yeah. conquering nature and physics rather th than each other, yeah. right, due to the incentive yeah. structure change. And for the environmentalists out there, we're also able to decarbonize the air, desalinate the water, all of these things just by making energy cheaper. We found a thousand carbon-based power plants around the globe that could be, um, you know, replaced with OTEC, hmm. totaling about 300 gigawatts of, you know, uh, coal, petroleum, natural gas that could be replaced with this. Wow. Well, guys, this is uh, quite the vision for the future. Uh, you've given me a lot to think about. Uh, really appreciate you guys doing this. Do you want to let my audience know where they can find out more about you or your work? Yep. Find me at Nate Hawaii uh, on Twitter and our uh, you know website where you can subscribe to our Substack and get all of our updates. Yeah. Uh, OceanBitEnergy.com and and I'm at Michael Hawaii on Twitter. Thank you so much for having us. Of course. This is a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.